Hello there, Alaskans, wherever you are. Welcome to the Must Read Alaska Show. Coming to you from somewhere in Alaska. This is the place where we talk about, you guessed it, Alaska. Where we keep the mainstream media on their toes and where we are standing up for what's right in a world run by leftists. You can find out more by heading over to mustreadalaska.com and also checking out the Must Read Alaska YouTube channel for some really great content. But first, let's get this party started. Welcome, everybody, to the Must Read Alaska show. I'm your host, John Quick, coming to you live from somewhere in Alaska. Man, hopefully last night was the rest, the last of the coldest nights here uh, in the Anchorage kind of Kenai Peninsula area. I know that um, uh, it's been a tough run for our uh, gas company and i hope that uh, last night was maybe their their last toughest night here that they see for this winter um if everybody likes must read alaska they listen to it they watch it they read it i want to thank you for doing that if you want to help keep the lights on here at mustreadalaska.com just go to mustreadalaska.com on the right hand side there's a little donate button if you want to help sponsor the must read alaska show you can email me john j Chen at mustreadalaska.com and i'd love to have a conversation with you but without further ado, we have a very special guest today, Joel Hall, who is the president of the AFL-CIO, which is the largest uh, union federation here in Alaska. I think they compile maybe 50 or so unions. She's got a big job, probably one of the most uh, influential jobs in the state of Alaska. But without further ado, welcome to the Must Read Alaska show. Well, thank you, Jonathan. Appreciate it. Glad yeah, to be su- here. Super excited that you're here. And uh, for folks that are listening we're going to hear all about um, what this union federation does, some of uh, Joel's background. So I want to make sure that you all tune in for the next 20 minutes. It'll be a fun ride. Um, so, Joel, share with folks where you grew up and uh, kind of what got you involved in a union in the first place. I'd love to hear that story. I grew up in California. Um, uh, my dad was a, was a school teacher and was the president of his union. My mother was a wallpaper hanger, so I grew up in a you know blue collar family. Grew up in, in Sacramento, California. Um, uh, uh, right out of high school, I joined the army. Spent four years on active duty, another three or four years in the guard. But when I came home to California to go to college, I was going to city college, and I wanted to go to the university. And I had a uncle who was a professor at UAF, and he persuaded me at a family reunion to give <laughs> UAF a chance in 1990. And I moved to Stock and Barrel to Fairbanks in 1990 and um, switched to the Alaska National Guard because you get in-state tuition if, you get, if you're in the Alaska National Guard. But my third day in Alaska, I met this really good-looking guy at the Armory on Wayne Street, who has now been my husband for a very long time. Congratulations. <laughs> so I got to Alaska, met my husband like in the first four days. Um, and so... You know, he was born and raised here, uh, and born and raised in Juneau. We were we met in Fairbanks. Um, so we were having our big Alaska adventure, you know, the whole Fairbanks scene, you know, the dry cabin. We're inholders in the Yukon Charlie Preserve. I was getting to see all kinds of amazing spots of Alaska. And he was in the military, uh, retired from the military. And um, so I started, you know, I graduated from college, got my first couple of jobs working in politics. And then uh, we got transferred to Anchorage. And um, so I did some other work, um, but we had, we had our first child in 1999. And so I decided that I wanted to scale back my work. My husband was a fairly high ranking enlisted man by then. And so I, Scaled back, but I had my own consulting business for about 10 years. And so I started coming, I started working for the labor movement in 2006. I was hired by my predecessor's predecessor, a man named Jim Sampson, who y'all may know. He was the Fairbank, he was the commissioner of labor in the Knowles administration. He was um, the business manager of the 942, the labor's local out of Fairbanks. Uh, we knew each other from Fairbanks. And if you've met, ever met anybody from Fairbanks, that's really the only that's the entire qualification list. Like, oh, you're from Fairbanks? Great, you're hired. So Jim <laughs> hired me. <laughs> we did know each other, but uh, I met that qualification. I was from Fairbanks. Um, so I started working on the labor campaign, you know, in the election cycle to elect pro-labor candidates. And um, then Vince Beltrami was elected because Jim stepped down. Vince uh, brought me back on in 2008 to do the campaign again. And then from there, I've been here full time. So nice. I really started working at the AFL-CIO nearly 20 years ago. 
Um, and then I, I was the political director until Vince retired. And then um, I was elected by the affiliates. Uh, I guess that was two years ago now. So um, I've been able to serve now as the president for those years. And um, I w I'm a member of UFCW Local 1496, which is an Anchorage union, well, it's a statewide union, I should say. And it's grocery store workers and office works. And they have a lot of the contracts for uh, the union staff in offices is never, almost never represented by the union that they work for. It's kind of a complicated relationship because, of course, it's a bargaining relationship, right? You're yeah. bargaining, so you don't really bargain against yourself. So the staff in a union is usually represented by a different union than the one that they're working in. So I'm represented by 1496, as is the staff here at the Alaska AFL-CIO. Nice. So, so tell us a little bit about the Alaska AFL CIO because you and I were just talking before, and I even got something wrong. It's a union federation. It's not a union in itself. So, talk to me about the uniqueness about this uh, union federation for folks that uh, maybe don't know the ins and outs of it. Sure. This is a common uh, kind of misperception about how our structure works. First off, you know, the American AFL-CIO and every single AFL-CIO in every state in the union, we're all structured the same way. We all have an elected leader and we're all a federation of the unions that are in that particular state or in the, in the, in, in the U.S., of course, in the whole country. So every single state has a different constellation of unions that are working in their, in their, in their workforces, right? So... Washington State would have Boeing workers, or used to have Boeing workers. They're going to have a lot. They have a giant longshore presence. Um, we would have a different constellation. Some some states, the NEA in their state is inside the AFL CIO. In most states, it is not. So every state's really different in terms of like who's in, who's out, and what is the composition of their labor movement. Alaska's AFL-CIO, it's about 50 unions, 50,000 members, and we're about a 50-50 proposition, 50% 50 public employees and 50% private unions, so construction trades, grocery store workers, hotel and restaurant workers, that's about 50%. <laughs> Excuse my little cough. So we're about 50-50, um, and um, so what that does is it, uh, it creates a um, you know, we, of course, have a mutual interest in solidarity. We have a mutual interest in collective bargaining. We have a mutual interest in those types of things. But from there, like the politics can get like different from local to local. Right. And so you'll see that in some states, they'll have a gigantic local. And then that gigantic local, Nevada, for example, culinary union is the biggest union by leaps and bounds because it represents the whole Vegas Strip. It's probably... 75% of the union members in Nevada belong to one union. Oh, wow. So every state's really different. Um, we happen to be a 50-50 kind of arrangement. And so that means that we have to, you know, we have a lot of debate internally about the positions that we take. And it also means that it's important for our unions to understand each other's needs because the need of a public employee union is going to be really different than the need of an operating engineer, right? So we spend a lot of time building that bridge across the union so we can all understand each other's needs, especially, um, you know, in a legislative environment, because that's the AFL-CIO's job is to be the political and legislative arm of the labor movement writ large in Alaska, right? Our unions represent members. They do grievances. They bargain contracts. Um, we don't. We don't do that, right? No. Our job is to work at the federation level to come to consensus on issues of public policy. Try to move that public policy. Work to build everybody together. If we have to defend against a piece of public policy that we don't agree with, and then um, you know, just work to educate people. Uh, overall about what unions do, what they don't do. So that's kind of how AFLs work and what their purpose is. Nice. So how, how important is you is it for you to maintain uh, good relationships on both sides of the aisle? Because just listening to you say that, I think, you know, probably not in your best interest to go piss everybody off. You probably got to keep a good relationship with folks. 
Well, you, that's always a tricky thing. It's always the goal, right? Um, the unions, in, inside of a union, the people inside of a union are not that much different than the people inside of any group of Alaskans, right? In terms of their partisan makeup. Um, we are, um, so that means that there are lots and lots of people who be, maybe per perceive themselves as being conservative, but who are, who are very, who are very conservative, but also in unions, mm -hmm. right? I mean, lots and lots of people. <laughs> so there's no, it's not mutually exclusive to be in a union and you know, like lots of Republicans are, and conservatives are in unions. So we work really hard to talk to those members to make sure that we understand like the kinds of things that they're going through in their workplaces. And legislatively, we always try to work across the aisle and, and sometimes we can, and, and sometimes, you know, people just, people just disagree and yeah. they don't share our values and, 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 and that's their prerogative, right? So we work with people that we can, and if we don't share values, like if we can't find common ground, then we then we just can't find common ground. So your union member or your union federation probably covers all of Alaska, all the nooks and crannies. You probably mm -hmm. get to hear stories from, you know, working class people from all over Alaska. Are you hopeful for Alaska's economy as a leader in Alaska um, or or <laughs> are we or are better days behind us or do we still have better days in front of us? Well, that's a really good question. I'm still excited about Alaska's future. I do. It's funny. I was having a conversation yesterday. I know we want to talk a little bit about the pipeline. I was talking to somebody the other day, yesterday, about the jobs that are coming. You know what the grip funding is, right? With the renew, that's the uh, grid Rene reliability improvement project. I think okay. it's a project or program. So this is federal funding that we are we've gotten a two hundred million dollars from the federal government. We need to we need to appropriate two hundred million dollars because we need to upgrade our 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 grid in the rail belt. And we need to have a redundant system inside the rail belt so that we can onboard um, well a anything any kind of energy being created by any source right natural gas wind solar all of the above. We have to have a redundant grid and a grid that shares that energy up and down the intertie. I mean, we've learned this lesson in the last 24 hours, right? We're getting a lot of hand wringing and concern from our utilities because we, they're getting a little maxed out as cold as it is. Um, my attitude about energy is yes and. Yes and. Mm -hmm. All of the above. I think that the lesson that our we have to psychically turn the corner on is that there's a competition between a solar project and a wind project and a gas line. There is no competition. The more energy you put into the system, the lower the cost goes, the more business you attract. So I don't want to participate in a false narrative that these things are in competition with each other because I don't believe they are. I was asked yesterday by some people who are, you know, maybe tending to more to the environmental side. And, and the answer from the Alaska AFL is, you know, is always, we will build anything. Yeah. We will build anything. Like we want to build your a pro, pipeline. Pro, your pro project. <laughs> pro project. We will build a pipeline. Absolutely. We will build your solar farm. We will build your wind farm. We will build, we'll build all the things. And I think Alaska um, you know, we have, we're having a scarcity of how of the fuel source to generate electricity. And we are going to have to understand that it might take that the future, it the, the, our future economy is actually predicated on reliable, inexpensive energy. And we may need to throw a lot of energy and thought and interest and money behind all, all of the yes and approach, yeah. not one or the other. So let's chat a little bit about the LNG project. It's a project that's been, you know, mm -hmm. been worked on for, I don't know, 20 years. It's got, I once saw the pile of paperwork that it's taken the, <laughs> mm -hmm. for, for the federal, the federal uh, government to go through, you know, six feet tall of paperwork. What's right. the, um, what's the, uh, you, what's your uh, company's position on the LNG project? Is it excited about it? Is it weary about it? is tell, tell me the tell me what your guys's position is and what your thoughts on it are i don't i think that um we're very excited we have been i mean you know 
I would imagine Jim Sampson and Mano Fry and Vince Palprami would say the same thing. Because we, you know, this has been a, this has been an issue of discussion for 40 years, right? Mm -hmm. But here we sit today with um, you know, permits in our hot little hands, a market that wants our gas, and a world and and a a um an economy and not an economy, a um a, a supply chain that's constrained by the Panama Canal when the the major consumers are all in Asia. We're uniquely positioned, right? So the question now is we have FERC permits, we have a market, we have a we have a delta that's a cash, like the build out of it. It's a cash problem. And I don't know if you read the story recently that featured um do you know who Joey Merrick is? Yeah. He's the he's the yeah, he's the business manager of Labor Local 341. He's been working on building a setting up an LLC to try to bring in a funder group to help drive down that delta so that we can actually build this pipeline. Um the the question is is there a market? Yes. It's always been a question of, is there a market that justifies the expense of building the entire pipeline and transporting, right? So what Joey is trying to do and this group is trying to do is to help drive down the cost of the construction so that we can afford to ship our gas, either either produce it for ourselves in part and then ship it overseas. So yeah, I, think he I, has, I think I heard it was what, $32 billion or I don't know, there's a bunch of figures that have been thrown out over the years. <laughs> well, I think that what Joey's got his hooks into is some um, commitments and some funding for what's called the feed, the pre-feed and feed phase, you know, where you're actually doing the the initial investment decisions and the initial set of construction. And he has been talking actually to um, uh, some union institutions that are large scale institutions that have, you know, uh, investment level capital to work with. And he's got some letters of interest. I think it's like Ulico, which is a union life insurance company and a couple other institutions, you know, that have been around serving the labor movement for, you know, a hundred years. And, um, they're looking at, and they, he has some commitments that they are looking to be one of the investment partners. So it's just a different source of capital, right? It's not, it's not, Wall Street capital, it's not hedge fund capital, it's 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 just a different group of people with 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 their own capital. Yeah. And so he's working on trying to put together a deal so that we can get we can we can put some shovels in the dirt and we can get some gas. So what um we'll switch gears for a second. What what do you think you want the average person to know about the uh the unions here in Alaska? I think you know, sometimes conservatives are not big fans of public unions. Um, and, you know, uh, I think what I always tell people is this is what 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 makes America awesome. Right. So you can believe one thing. I can believe another thing. We can have a conversation and not scream and whine and throw a tantrum. But what's something you wish folks would know about the average union in Alaska that maybe they don't know because they just right out the gate don't like unions. And so they never get to hear about, you know, the thing that you're going to tell us. Well, it's a really good question. I think what I would say is the basic premise of a union is very simple. It's that your First Amendment rights don't end when you walk through the door at work. Right. You have a you have a right to freedom of association. You have a right to have your voice heard on the job. You have a right to have a say and whether you're safe or not. We fundamentally believe that the first that your first amendment rights don't end when you walk in the door at work. And then we use those first amendment rights to associate together so that we can, you know, bargain for wages and benefits, working conditions. Um and that is like the the basic philosophy that 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 we organize around. I think one of the things that would be uh really interesting for most people who don't work in the labor movement, I mean, I think you know in this country we are in an upsurgence of union organizing, right? I mean, it's we're organizing as fast as we can. Um, we're organizing in a system that's not tilted in our favor, it's tilted in the favor of the employers, but we're still organizing, we're still getting it done. Um, I think what would surprise most people is that it is actually working conditions 
that most people form a union over. It is really not wages and benefits, right? It is the way they're being treated on the job. So it is capricious. It is like a ba one bad manager, and now you've got a situation on your hands. I mean, we all know that. We've all had that one boss, right, who was arbitrary, capricious, maybe retaliatory, you know, gave certain people preference over this person. Like just, you know, just one bad manager can change the culture of your workplace. And then people are like, I I just can't have this anymore. I can't be treated. It, it can't be so um, arbitrary the way we're being treated. So it is usually that type of an experience that results in somebody calling the union you know, in new organizing, obviously there's lots of job sites that have already been organized and organized for a hundred years, right? I mean, some jobs are, you know, you can work union construction or non-union construction. There's, there's plenty out there for everybody, especially now, right? So you have a choice. You can choose to work a union job with a pension and healthcare and, um, and a hiring hall that, you know, allows you to move from job to job to job with seamless benefits and transition, or you can work non-union totally. I mean, both those things exist in the world. And a lot of times they get paid pretty well on both sides of the aisle. So you can, it's a, just a choice at the, in the construction side. I do hear this a lot uh, 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 from conservatives about public employee unions. Um, I guess what I would say is, um, I tend to look at a union protection in the public employment is it's a protection from the political whims of the elected leader. It's the most important job of a union in the public employment in public employment. So that somebody doesn't come in and fire everybody down to the DMV so that they can hire in their, their you know, their buddy Bob. Right. So because you have to be able to deliver government services. And the day that this really struck me, um, it's an interesting, like, I think that most people who remember this day, it was the day that uh, Bush v. Gore was decided. And you had, a, it's a monumental moment in American democracy, right? You have a court say, this guy, not this guy. Mm -hmm. Now, what happened the next day? Not a darn thing. The DMVs opened, people went to work. Because, because in our system of government, those people who deliver the services every day are shielded from the vagaries of the politics above them. And I think that's imperative to delivering services. You have to have some level of, of public employee that's protected from the political whims of the people above them. Of course, there's always going to be people who are political appointees and who serve at the pleasure of that's also super important, right? You have to, be able to bring your team in. You have to, be able to execute your vision to a certain extent, <laughs> but you also <clears throat> should not be able to fire everybody down the aisle and have, um, you know, just kind of a a system that has no real um, no real accountability for why you hire and fire somebody that's delivering the services to the public. That's my rationale. That's how I think about. It. In particular, the value of what a union provides in the public space is that protection, regardless of your political persuasion. You know, that 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 draconian behavior could happen on from any elected official who just kind of just gets, you know, that's something that I that I think is very important we protect from. Awesome. So my last question to you this is this, Joel. You are the president of the AFL CIO, one of the one of the biggest jobs in Alaska. Who do you look up to? Who's been a hero in your life? Uh, somebody that you look up to and why? Oh, well, two people come to mind. One, um, I first worked in the legislature in 1993. I was a University of Alaska intern mm -hmm. um, that year. Uh, were you an intern? No. You smiled like you know it was. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, there's a great program at the University of Alaska where you can do a semester or you can work in a session as an intern. And uh, the woman I worked for was Fran Ulmer. And Fran Ulmer is an amazing public servant who is, you know, to this day serving our country in all, she's an um, Arctic, she works in an Arctic environment. Ar she's like maybe an Arctic ambassador now. I mean, She's an amazing person. 
of character and intellect. And I admire her greatly. And I feel so privileged to have worked for her. Um, and to be able to answer the phone sometimes and she's like, let's have coffee. I mean, it's like, I fangirl to this day over fan. <laughs> That's awesome. I love her. And secondly, I'm going to say my predecessor, Vince Beltrami. And the reason why is because um, I learned so much. I mean, obviously, when you're in the military, you go to leadership training. You, you know, I'm a, you know, I've been around a little while, but watching um, somebody really manage this federation for 10 years and learn how to, I mean, like, we have our own tensions inside of our system, right? Like, you know, we're a big family and sometimes we fight too, you know? So how do you manage the family? And watching him do it so well for all of those years, it um, and to have the respect he had from the public and the way that he was regarded. Um, he was somebody that I got to work alongside for 10 years. I just learned a tremendous amount. So I, I would say those two people. Awesome. Well, 30 minutes has gone by in a flash. Oh, that was fast. <laughs> Any last minute thoughts here before we head out? Floor is yours. Oh, well, thank you very much for the for the invitation. I've really enjoyed myself. Um, if you ever have a question about how we endorse a candidate and why we've taken a public policy, I'm more than happy to talk about why we did what we did and what are what are the systems by which we do that. Um and we are, um, we have, you know, nearly 20% union density in this state. We are a very high union density state. One, the, every fifth house, that's a union family in that house. And they are your neighbors and they are, they work in your businesses and they are um, on your kids, they coach your kids soccer team. And we're just regular people out working for a living. And uh, we just want to ensure that people in Alaska can get have good jobs and get treated fairly on their job and retire with dignity. That's our entire purpose. Nice. Well, thank you so much, Joelle Hall, for joining us. For folks that maybe just caught the last 10 minutes or so, um, Joelle is the president of the AFL-CIO, the biggest union federation here in Alaska, 50,000 members strong. And I want to encourage you to go back and listen to the whole thing just to hear from her point of view and her perspective on why she cares about union jobs here in Alaska. Um, and I'll put the links to all of your information in the description. If anybody wants to check out the uh, AFL-CIO's website or ask questions for you, they can contact you through there. Um, thanks again, Joelle, for joining us. And until next time, I'm John Quick.